Throughout time, many writers have seemingly predicted the way our society would evolve. They wrote books about how it would become more restrictive, be more controlled, essentially becoming a dictatorship disguised as a free world. The question remains, however, who exactly are these visionaries such as Orwell, and how did they acquire such knowledge? He was, by all accounts, an extremely nice guy. He worked for the BBC for quite a long time. He produced over, I think it was 125 shows for them. Interviewed some real top people, some really interesting people for that show, for his shows. Um, strangely, no record of his voice exists, even though he worked for the BBC for all that time. Um, one of the reasons for that is because his throat was damaged in the Spanish Civil War. So his voice was slightly strange. What was he doing in the Spanish Civil War? A lot of very clever people got involved in the Spanish Civil War. Um, which was, and can be proven to be, led by Freemasons. They were very proud of the fact that they were involved in that uprising. There are texts showing that they were pleased that they had got 5,000 um, people within the military. They actually stood there and said it, and wrote, transcribed those details down. So we know that there is a secret society that was involved in revolutionary factions in Spain. George Orwell was one of the guys involved there. So involved that he, you know, he, he got his throat shot. H.G. Wells was a man who was seriously into all the world of the esoteric secret societies. You know, he got involved with Rosicrucians and all kinds of different things. Jules Verne, definitely a man who was involved. These are these are people that, as as you rightly point out, were involved in the esoteric, involved in the secret societies, highly involved in politics, H.G. Wells was certainly, I mean, he's the man who, to who coined the term New World Order. Um, so they were definitely involved. H.G. Wells spent a lot of time in, in, in Russia, but the communists came back and gave a glowing report, some bad, some good, but mainly glowing. Spent time in America with the high politicians there, was deeply influential with the UN, the beginnings of the UN. In fact, a lot of people think that, that the UN was formed from his very own ideas and that's, that's actually, you know, historical fact that he was deeply involved with that. H.G. Wells, you mentioned, I mean, he, he was somebody, um, I would strongly recommend your, your, anybody this, watching to, to look into an organisation called the Coefficients. And that was a, it was a think tank, really, one of the first British think tanks. And he was a member of it for, I think, at least seven years, 1902, 1909, this kind of period. Bertrand Russell was also in that group, Sir Edward Grey. Uh, it, was a, it was a real think tank of the British elite at that time. Yeah? And it was brought together by Sidney and Beatrice Webb, who were socialists. So it was bilateral, do you see? bit like your, your new Labour project. Yeah? They were trying to draw together all kinds of people from different perspectives to answer the question, how can the empire survive in the 20th century and go forward in a position of dominance? And H.G. Wells was in there. And he, of course, came with his scientific idealism, his scientific utopianism. Uh, personally, I would call him almost sort of bordering on a sort of a social fascism, which he had. Yeah? Um, and that was really that the individual exists for the state. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Conan Doyle is another one. Conan Doyle was a Freemason. Highly influential. Built what they learnt into their stories as George Orwell did, knew full well that a lot of these secret societies' intentions were, as they saw it, good. But to, to create this utopia on earth, to have this new Jerusalem, and I think that a lot of that comes through in the, in the books. The thing that people need to look at when they're looking at 1984 and, and other um, examples of novels or prophecies or whatever um, that projected forward long distances and have proved to be accurate in terms of what's happening today they need to ask themselves how could they 
all those decades ago and more, predict that things were going to happen with technology that hadn't even been invented then. How would they know that? Well, it's interesting that George Orwell was working for the BBC at the time that he wrote 1984 and um, apparently wrote some of it actually at Bush House, the headquarters of the World Service. So um, I think he, he had uh, a certain insight into some of the rather more, should we say, extremist elements within the ruling class in this country. And I think he was aware that there is quite a nasty strain of ruling class people in Britain who have a lot of power uh, and who have a complete disregard for human life and that was seen uh, in the Second World War to be something which was just simply a German thing. I think yes obviously it was largely a Nazi ideology was totally pernicious towards human life but I think they were, they were documented uh, particularly in the United States um, with George Bush's family and Prescott Bush, there was support for the Nazis within the Western world and certainly within Britain. Um, we had a king who had to be sort of quietly shuffled out of the way who was uh, pro-fascist and I think there, there's clear evidence that there's still some kind of covert fascist uh, influence within the British ruling class. All the things that are going on on all the levels, political, technological, um, secret society operations, black operations, are leaked to us in the movies. Um, I don't really have a complete understanding of why they choose fictional means. I mean, you know, the jury's out. All I know is that they do do it. With online media playing such a fundamental role in our everyday lives, the effect of viewing alternative information in documentaries and presentations can have profound implications. And while you may want to inform everyone in your circle of friends and family, you may have some resistance to your attempt at enlightenment. You get hurt because you suddenly found you've been told this like, massive lie, you know, and, and most of the things that you, you believed in, you know, have, you know, have just been shattered. <clears throat> so as soon as you, you find someone like that out, you start investigating more and more and you think, well, what else have they done? What else have they been up to? You know, and I, and I went down the road and I, and I started looking at all this sort of kind of agenda. And one of my favourite books when I was a kid, like, was like, you know, 1984. Um, and I, I had read A Brave New World, but didn't rate it, rate it as much. But when I started looking at certain things to do with that and certain things that were going on in the world, it, a couple of things started to click. Um, someone who is completely welded to this so-called five sense solid reality and believes that it's real and believes that this world is all there is or believes in some religious deity or whatever, um, it's gonna be one hell of a shock when they realize um, that their whole belief system was fraudulent, their whole belief system was uh, completely illusory and it's basically like sitting in a room and other people in the room in the little room are telling you that this is all there is there is nothing else or the something else beyond the room is some religious deity and you get brought up in that room, you, your whole experience and knowledge and everything comes from that room. And then someone comes along and takes the lid off. Have a look at that, darling. I mean, it's going to blow your mind, isn't it? Uh, the, I think the first reaction is incredulousness. Why, that can't be. You know, I didn't hear that on CNN or Fox. Uh, my parents didn't tell me about that. Nobody in school told me about that. But if you can get past that, and some people cannot, but if you can, then you start researching on your own, you suddenly find that the whole world and the history of the world is very different from what you've been taught. I say that uh, in my work, I'm always emphasizing that light both conceals as much as it reveals. And I'm kind of shocked that you know people haven't noticed this simple dynamic. Light conceals as much as reveals. Could it be then that the Illuminati are using light because for the same reason as a policeman when he shines light in your face he's blinding you? That light has this principle to also blind you? 
in the United States, after all, we've put people in prison for conspiracy. And yet, when we talk about a conspiracy at the corporate or government level, they tend to poo-poo it and say, well, there can't be any such thing. What hogwash. So who is running the show, you might ask? Well, that's the tricky part. This new world order is centuries in the making. And just when you think you've identified the bad guy, he's hung out to dry in an attempt to maintain face, as the agenda is all that matters. And no one is more important than the agenda. This is a team game, and the team serves the agenda, no matter what. It's like a global spider's web. The center of the spider, or the, the spider in the center of the web, is in Europe. It's in, on operational level. It's in places like London and Rome and Paris and, and Germany. This web goes out across the world and each strand in the web is an organization or a secret society that answers to the spider. The closer the strand is to the spider, the more secretive it is, the more exclusive it is. And if we're talking about names, what these guys try to do in the most secretive of their organizations is not to give them names at all. Because it's much more difficult to research something and uncover something that doesn't have a name. You want to try it. So you have to give it a name. You have to take that power away um, from this technique of no naming and give it a name it doesn't matter if that's what they call it or not you've given it a name and therefore you've given it uh, an existence which you can then start to um, uncover it so I call it the Illuminati and that's a, a name that's, that's often been used I mean, it's been used uh, officially by an organization called the Bavarian Illuminati which came obviously out of Germany through the Rothschilds and a guy called Adam Weishaupt. But that's not the Illuminati I'm talking about. That's a strand in the web. The web I call the Illuminati um, goes back thousands of years and beyond. So Illuminati is a modern term. That's what we're discussing. Is a term for this idea that all the secret societies of the world are all joined up at the hip and controlled from the top. Um, in all the years of researching that I've done, I haven't yet found that man with the white cat and I don't personally believe that there is a man there with a the white cat stroking it telling Mr Bond that he's going to die. Um, I really don't see that personally. What I do see, I do see men conspiring at every level whether it's in the schoolyard or whether it's down at the Freemasonic Club or whether it's at Parliament or Congress. Wherever it is, men conspire. There isn't just one psychopathic super criminal at the top, which you know is about as ludicrous as saying that there's a lone assassin you know was involved in the JFK murder. No, no, no. There's a bloodline. There's a generational thing going on here. There's a dragon court in operation, and they use the dragon symbol and they use the serpent symbol. It's right there in your face because that's their logo. Why should they not use it? You know, a football team uses their logo. The police use their logo. The religions use their logo. The medical profession uses their logo, so does the Dragon Court. The Council on Foreign Relations um, and the Trilateral Commission in America, they are not known by most people in the public, but they're knowable, they, they operate in public, uh, because that's, that's the, the spider's web starting to interact with mainstream society. Just a little bit back from that is the Bilderberg Group. And when you think that the, the real action is played out through these really exclusive secret societies close to the spider that dictate to the, whole, the entire web, the Bilderberg Group is a strand in the web. And they, they have what, what I call um, defend the first domino. They know, for instance, that if the first domino goes down, it hits another domino, another domino, and it suddenly you, you, you're starting to move. For instance, if you allow uh, alternative healing to become widespread in society and accepted, the next question is, how does it work? So the first domino goes down, okay, alternative healing, we accept it works, we're gonna, it's gonna come part of mainstream society. Next domino, how does it work? 
Next domino. Well, reality is not like we think it is. So you defend the first domino. And so with the, the spider's web, they want to defend um, the outer reaches of the, the web so you don't start to get deeper into it. So they're quite happy for people to think that the Bilderberg Group is, is it. That's where it's all being orchestrated through. Because they're out here. They're not where it really is. Well, they won't tell us themselves what the objectives are. In fact, what they say is that they're um, uh, just a private club that wants peace and this kind of thing. Uh, ultimately, if you look at what they've been pushing for, it's consolidation of power to themselves. Uh, if you look at the policies that have come out of Bilderberg, albeit unofficially through Chatham House rules, which means that you are allowed to promulgate these policies, but you're not allowed to say where that you heard about them. Uh, and it's all to do with consolidation of power. For example, uh, there's no whisper of forgiving debt into third world countries. Now, I would say that that is a place to start. In, in many ways, we are in in debt to the third world countries for the way that we've abused them over the years, over the centuries even. And the idea that they should owe us something, I just find ridiculous. Now this is, this sort of idea is never to be found at a Bilderberg meeting. Uh, the other thing is that they are uh, essentially looking at uh, potential new leaders. That is to say they are uh, screening, vetting, interviewing, uh, potential new prime ministers, presidents uh, around the NATO zone uh, and it is clearly um, tied in with NATO as well. The Secretary General of NATO always seems to appear magically at a Bilderberg conference the year before he gets nominated and um, they do seem to wave this kind of what I call a magic wand of power. They bring someone along to a Bilderberg meeting and uh, amazingly enough they become the next year maybe the leader of the opposition and then of course possibly the prime minister and someone who's in charge of the country this is the way that tony blair was uh, uh, slowly went on the ramp to success and to be prime minister of britain was i mean he was a bilderberg conference uh, the year before he was nominated to be party leader of the labor party for example i noticed that this year at the bilderbergers event um, the top guy of google is going to be there i don't need to say any more we're fill in the gaps with that one why on earth would google why is it so powerful you know fill the gaps in so these things are definite there are definitely men trying to control the situation trying to run things for us i wouldn't say that there is one top man i wouldn't say that there is one top club but they all seem to be like interwoven that's the that's what the evidence shows the rest of it, unfortunately, um, becomes part of the imagination. The trouble with Freemasonry is it's very difficult to actually pin it down because mm. nobody in, within Freemasonry will confirm or deny any allegations that are made about it. Now, this we will not confirm or deny approach, I think, is always to any journalist should immediately raise suspicions. If someone will not confirm or deny anything, then there better be a, a very good reason why they won't. because. The job of journalists and the job of all organisations should be to tell the truth. Now, as soon as someone is not confirming or denying anything, then what they're doing is they are uh, imposing what, what would normally be something to do with private privacy on a public body. So we're often told that Bilderberg is a private meeting. The only trouble is that the people at that private meeting are all, almost all, if not every single one of them, is a public figure with a great deal of public responsibility. So what they're trying to do is dress up these uh, supranational pressure groups and uh, very powerful organisations that formulate policy and saying it's just a private meeting. Well, it's just poppycock. Well, if one makes a study of Freemasonry, you find it's just rife with all kinds of symbolism uh, that involves uh, Illuminati symbolism, Knights Templars, uh, Egyptian, uh, Greek. Uh, so they have a di distinct historic worldview. The problem with Freemasonry is uh, that it has a large outer circle and a small inner circle. Now, the outer circle does lots of good things here in the United States. They have burn centers and hospitals for children, and they, they're, they're very civic-minded, and that's all well and good. Uh, the inner core uh, may have a 
a deeper agenda. But of course, if you ask a Freemason, is there an outer core and an inner core, I guarantee you he's going to tell you no. Because he's either a member of the outer core, in which case he does truly does not know there is this inner core elite, or he's a member of the inner core elite and has taken a blood oath not to reveal that. So it's the secrecy of this that causes uh, uh, a lot of people a problem. You know, ever since the days of John D, Queen, Queen Elizabeth's, you've probably heard of him, right? Queen Elizabeth's astrologer. We know that the, the elite in this country have worked with deeply esoteric principles, whether it be the military intelligence services um, or the Freemasonic, the Freemasonic circles. There's, there's esoteric knowledge behind a very great deal of what they do. I hear so often people say, so-and-so is it. It's the Freemasons. It's the this, it's the that. It, it's not any of them exclusively. This analogy of the spider's web is crucial to understanding it. Um, the, the spider at the center of the web, all the strands going out from the spider um, that are different organizations and secret societies, but the key is the web that, that, that holds it all together. So if you go high enough, or using the same analogy, deep enough into the web, then the Knights of Malta are the Freemasons. The Freemasons are the Jesuits because they're one unit working together under different names. Freemasonry is very, very important because it's so vast. Um, around the world and it's a coordinating uh, organization uh, that gets the same things happening in different parts of the world because it itself is a web it's th these are webs within webs well the bloodline question is fundamental again and the symbols of the bloodline one of the most important symbols of the bloodline can be seen and is seen by thousands of tourists in the front of Buckingham Palace it's the red lion and the white unicorn the reason for bloodline is simply this, the atonists were always few, and you can't run the world with just a few people, no matter how evil you are. So you have to have a um, administrative body, you must have lackeys, you must have minions, you must have lieutenants. I think that you would have to look to business these days, and I think that you will find that, that battles still ensue. That, that religions still want to fight politicians and politicians want to fight religions and that businessmen are on both sides. Um, I think that you will find that the best places to look are not necessarily the elected politicians but those unelected ones that we call civil servants. You will find that if you want to talk about bloodlines, there are some incredible bloodlines within the civil service. These are unelected officials which tell our elected officials, supposedly elected officials in our supposed democracy, um, what to do. Well, the big, the big battle that's going on in the, in the ruling classes, the political classes at the moment, and the, and, and the opinion formers, is over uh, what is this new world order going to look like. I don't think anyone is saying that the, the world is going to stay the same because uh, we're seeing, we're seeing economic meltdown, we're seeing increased political integration, but there's a contest for what kind of new world order we're going to have. Uh, now, personally, I think we're not in any situation where having some kind of world government at the moment would be a good idea, because uh, it seems that the ruling classes and the, the more right-wing elements in the ruling class have really taken over that idea. This is a mentality that would quite would be quite ready to take down the whole planet in one battle between what would be perceived as good and evil. Uh, and that's clear in some of the mentality of, of, of Christian leaders like Tony Blair, who will quite happily bomb 10,000 people to save them for civilization, the project. Um, and we see it in Afghanistan where the pursuit of the Taliban, well, there's a whole village in the way and unfortunately, you know, it got bombed. But it's, it's that kind of mentality on a larger scale, it's the same. It doesn't matter when you're playing the top game, whether it's 
a hundred people in a wedding party in a village, whether it's a convoy of refugees in, Bo in Bosnia, um, whether it's a, a hundred thousand, whether it's three thousand people in a skyscraper, even if they're your own people. Um, there isn't your own people at that level. For me, I don't want to sit and go, you know, these are the guys. I mean, you can sit and you can say, well, look, yeah, it's the Rothschilds, it's the Rockefellers, right? It's the Carnegie's, um, it's the Freemasons. Um, yes, it is. It's also IBM, it's Hewlett Packard, it's Sun, it's, it's, um, it's the tech companies, it's, the, it's, it's mobile, it's Exxon. What has happened is, the New World Order now is also multinational companies that operate above governments. So when you look at who actually does, and what's a really good provable point, is who does the census for the US? It's IBM. And they also get to GPS your front door as a bonus, right? Who does the census for Australia? It's IBM. And who does the census for communist China? It's IBM. So here you have a company that operates above government and uses people's details supposedly in countries that are meant to be in conflict. So there's the new world order at play. You have this illusion that you have China and America actually conflicting and fighting, or you know, like allies but not really allies, yet the same company is doing the census. Like, so who's really running the show? Though alternative media is on the increase, the mainstream networks and foundations have their own agenda, and they continue to tighten their grip around the unsuspecting public, using icons of film and TV to subtly promote certain behaviors. You might think more people would be aware of the deception, but the New World Order is relentless in its endeavor, and the people are cleverly distracted like an audience in a hypnotist's sideshow. Often journalists are blamed for the content in the newspapers and on broadcast and, 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 and stuff which is broadcast too. Uh, and actually, they are just pawns in some ways in this game, which the uh, increasingly is happening in the mainstream media, where big corporations are um, simply bought and sold on the open market for uh, for their political influence. And that's happening increasingly. I think there's a less and less trust in the from the British public in the press um, and really that decay in the accountability of our media began uh, probably in the mid early 1980s under Thatcher. If you don't agree with Fox News right you're out of the hive right so you, you how can you not believe mainstream news right so the the hive mind is always working it's it's working in many programs all the time so if you don't believe the war on terror, there's another program it's running, right? If you don't believe, um, you know, taking vaccines is good for your for your children, well, you know, there's another person that's that's not a drone or a worker bee that needs to be brought into the collective. So there's all these programs that are working to bring you into this this order out of chaos world, right? And the function of it is that you have no function. That's the function. The function is that you cease to operate as an individual and um, and you do as you're told because what that's what the hive dictates. What the queen bee does or wants, the queen bee gets. And the queen bee too can also be replaced because it doesn't matter about the queen. It matters about the hive and how the hive functions. I think that we have a world full of children that it's about time that they started to work things out and stop listening to a lot of the junk that's fed to them. Because I don't think that the junk is necessarily being fed to them in the food, although it is, without doubt. I think a lot of the junk is coming through all the mediums, radio, TV, internet, newspapers, whatever medium. That's where the junk's really coming from. It is such a fundamental foundation of this whole conspiracy. Keep from people by controlling education, by controlling the mainstream media, information, and by controlling mainstream science big time through funding, not, not, not least funding, you keep from the people the true, vast, infinite, all possibility nature of reality 
and you tell them this is what it is and they live their lives thinking constantly can't be done i can't do this that's impossible and it just keeps them in the pen when it comes to the theme of mind control or even mass control and it's you know it's um it's mechanics it's almost hard to find examples because it's all that it's ubiquitous almost every word that's used you know uh, not only the portrayal of certain archetypes animals women men um, races but even the certain the use of certain talismanic words you know and i'm including faster bigger better greater you know younger healthier you know um, all sorts of talismanic words and, and I used to teach children this to observe this, you know, waking them up to the fact that these terms are being used a lot in the media. But again, seeking for examples, it's every second. It's not one example, it's multiple. There's a whole barrage of this, you know, coming out of Hollywood, coming out of Madison Avenue. What's happening in the mainstream is that idea that I represent you, John Stewart represents you, X represents you, is, is, is a Pied Piper concept. Does he really represent you? Do you want such a person to represent you? And if you do, then is he not completely now in control of your allegiances and your affiliations, you see? And they can steer them in a, in a very much a Pied Piper way, wherever they want to go, sometimes this way, sometimes that way. Like those cops you used to see at the corner uh, or in the center of streets with the white armbands. This is the road they don't want you to go down, but this is the route they do want you to take. And so through this particular mechanism, and I do see it in shows very much like The Daily Show and also in the more pernicious types like the Bill O'Reilly's you know, syndrome, but people need to become very observant of this Glenn Beck. Not that these people don't have important and brilliant things to say, and after all they're journalists, they collate and summate, and they, it's good to, to poke fun you know, and be the court jester, but you're still in the court. You're still serving the boss. War on terror. Yeah. Fear of, uh, is he a terrorist? Is he a terrorist? Am I going to get blown up on the underground? You know, you, you got fear of those, of your fellow human beings. This is a fear in the feeling realm. And then we've had imposed upon us a fear of uh, our life system, support systems, fear of the environment. Can I trust this water? Is it fluoridated? Can I trust this food? Is it irradiated? You know, that's a fear of life, the, the, the life systems, yeah? But that fear is based, for example, like global warming, the whole debate about climate change and global warming, on our thoughts. What do we understand uh, the truth to be? Well, the question of fear is very important. In fact, it might even be fundamental. Because as Frank Herbert, the author, said, fear is the mind killer. And so the constant rug pulling economically, socially, military, you know, is, is a key part of all of this. Coming from a psychological background, I always distinguish fear from anxiety. I think it's important because fear ultimately is something external. You're afraid of things that are external. You're anxious about something internal. So yes, there's a certain um, architecture of fear and the installation and influx of fear on the external level. You know, oh my goodness, the economy. Oh my goodness, uh, you know, strange enemies at the gates. Oh my God, towers are burning, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My focus is much more on what is the concomitant of that within the psyche. And when you get into the question of anxiety, you then are really you know, following an important thread there because the anxiety uh, question is age old again. You're going back to a very long time you know, before this era, before the 20th century, into how anxiety, a person has been kept in perpetual anxiety. Of course, people in the lower class will say, well, there's nothing more anxiety than not being able to you know, make your own ends meet and not being able to feed your kids and pot potentially having to go off and die in foreign wars, etc., etc., etc. But more specifically, anxiety is what you're doing to yourself. Anxiety is based on your relationship between you and your own psyche. They take an already fragmented, already traumatized, already insecure person and barrage him again and again and again until his entire thinking is shut down. What happens is that his concept of time becomes uh, traumatized, fragmented, you know, disabled. He's anxious about the future, he's forgetful about the past. What also happens is that his brain is overstimulated now. What happens now, he's overstressed physically, his body breaks down, 
In other words, his immunity on a total, again, we've talked about the war of consciousness, or I've talked about the war of consciousness in my work. This is what it's all about. We're getting to the heart of the matter here. Once this immunity wholesale is lower, then you have the perfect slave. And he can be led towards a global village, or he can be led into complete servitude. In fact, he can even be led to die, you know, uh, in, a, in a completely willful state. He can willfully go to die for your causes. What the conspiracy, because the people behind the conspiracy understand how all this works. Their bottom line, their foundation of this entire conspiracy is to disconnect mind from consciousness, which is like going on the internet and instead of the guy at the keyboard deciding where he goes, the computer's now deciding. Even more than that, the computer's now deciding what you think of the websites when you get there. In other words, the computer has taken over. The machine, if you want to call it that, it's far more than that, but the machine has taken over. The techniques of control used by the New World Order are becoming more advanced. With huge technological advances in medicine and computers, these two areas are key in the manipulation of the human consciousness. While human beings have the ability to use such technology to better our existence, there will be, and always have been, those individuals and corporations who wish to use it as a tool of control and discipline. You, you basically have got, IBM actually started as a census company in 1896 um, by a gentleman called Herm, Herman Hollerith. Um, it became as, it started basically as a census company. So what they did is they got a contract with the US Census Bureau um, they then evolved that into an actual tabulating machine. What a tabulating machine was is really a computer um, in its earliest form. So the, the punch card system was basically a software engineered program in a sense where the Nazi regime would, would, would come to Thomas Watson from IBM and say, look, what we want is a punch card system that can um, document race, lineage, occupation, location, you know, inventory, create the punch card systems for us. So kind of like in, in software engineering, you go to your program and you say, look, this is what we want, right? And the end result is, you know, verification, validation, and the software program is produced. So what would happen is you'd have different punch cards depending on what the Nazi regime actually wanted. Now, what makes IBM totally guilty in this basic transaction is IBM didn't actually sell the Hollerith machines to Nazi Germany. They leased them. So you had over 2,000, you know, Hollerith machines on basically all, you know, from Auschwitz to all the camps. And being able to actually process 64,000 cards per hour, right, you could basically within one hour find all the Polish people who were, you know, let's say of one particular occupation um, that were Jewish or were Gypsy or African Negro. So what you could then do is utilizing that data, you could then basically start metering out the people and um, utilizing the information as power. So the, the census itself wasn't only limited to, you know, horse, livestock, cow. You actually had the, the Germans were out to find out the commodity for butter, like where was the butter stored? And the Danes were the actual guys that were hoarding all the butter. So what people need to do is look at IBM of what they accomplished with processing power of 64,000 cards per hour. And now we have the blue gene processors that can process 22.8 trillion computations a second, right? So, just have a think about that. People have, who've accepted this conspiracy uh, talk about the microchip being a device to track people. I keep saying all the time, there's never one reason for anything that these people do. Yes, on one level it's about tracking people, absolutely. But it's not only about that. It's about getting access to the body computer system, which is a electrochemical organism and manipulating it mentally, emotionally and physically through the chip. When you look at the eugenics program in the 40s, it was a case of let's get as much information of you as possible. 
now we have IBM releasing things like the DNA transistor, which is just, you know, the last, probably announced, I'd say, um, about a month or so ago, where they can actually reverse engineer your genome for roughly $1,000 to $100. So once you biometrically harvest everyone, you're right, and you've got your iris scan, your you know, your retina scan, your gait, your odor scan, um, your odor biometric, sorry, et cetera, right? From there on, what do they want? They want more. So they want your, your heart rhythm scan. They want your brain scan. They want you, so it, it goes from external biometrics to internal biometrics, and then eventually the holy grail is your genome, right? So once they've got the genome, IBM has then gone on record that we can actually now tailor vaccines to your genome. When you start going down that way of thinking, you know, that is going down an Orwellian nightmare. That is going down to become Hitler's wet dream. You know, Hitler armed with this technology, you know, he, he started to put in, how can we track individuals? How can we track things? He wanted to have systems to put barcodes, if you like, or numbers on each individual item. Why? Well, there's a lot of spectacles, a lot of objects that were discovered and found when they started eradicating people. It started off by identifying them. Once you've identified them, you can segregate them. Once you segregate them, they can only go into shops at certain times of day. They can only buy certain products. You can only smoke in certain areas. You move down that to a certain degree. You start moving things up. But over time, as these things become acceptable, we've lifted up eventually to the fact of would you mind just leaving your we know you've had a long journey would you just mind leaving your uh, clothes on the peg and remember the number on your peg later on or go and have a nice shower nobody would have thought anything different and anybody who did expose that was seen to be some kind of conspiracy theorist or freak and yet history shows us the same and now we've had Rwanda we've had China, we've had Russia, you know, far bigger scale than ever we ever saw with, with Hitler. If you can tailor a vaccine to a genome, you have a eugenics program. It's like the, the, the thing that can cure can kill. So the, the, the question is why is IBM doing this? And, and history has played itself out and it's playing itself out again. And the, the motives have not changed. It is exactly the same motives. And, and, and I guess the purpose of the research is to showcase um, when IBM actually went to market to get the DNA you know, from people, they hid behind National Geographic. So it wasn't IBM that went into market. They went, let's find out where your lineage comes from. Let's find out where the African tribes are. Are you African? Are you South American? And, and what it was, it was a cloak and dagger military operation to get people to hand over your DNA. Like, I mean, this is your DNA we're talking about. And, and you're gonna trust it with, with documented Nazi war criminals? Like, just, it, it's, I'm speechless sometimes. Yes, it's true. The elite uh, are big into eugenics, which could be here in Texas, we'd say, who's your daddy? Okay, and they have the idea, this was all started by aristocrats and people who thought that the ruling classes uh, somehow had more brain power and somehow were more capable of running the world than just the, the other commoners. Um, and of course, this is a very dangerous philosophy. For one thing, all you have to do is look back through history, you find some of the most shining examples, Beethoven, Mozart, uh, some of the greatest minds in history came from poor background. Uh, and when you do press this agenda of trying to establish a ruling aristocracy uh, that can run the planet, then all you have to do is look at the uh, Hitler's Nazi regime to see the end result. Because then it started slowly, well, we need to get the mental defectives and the people who are too ill uh, out of uh, circulation, which they did, and then they began to say, well, we don't want a breeding, so they began their sterilization program. And finally they said, well, we just got to get rid of the, the, the real riffraff, so they started their euthanasia program, and pretty soon they were marching people into the ovens at the concentration camps. This is what comes of that type of thinking. People like George Orwell were talking basically about barcoded people. Other people 
uh, who've talked about this in novels or said, you know, in statements to various people that this is what's coming because they know. They have over the decades predicted technology or predicted changes in society that required technology like the microchip that no one even thought of in the mainstream then. For me, when I actually saw Verichip going into market and testing the waters in regards to, you know, the human microchip, um, what I actually did is I sat back and I saw, you know, like here's a company that's actually going to market with a human implantable microchip. And the event itself was publicised, televised, and from my perspective I thought, okay, here we have you know, human beings actually being reduced to inventory, right? And what's going to happen? So I, I gauge the, the feedback. I thought, you know, the church is going to revolt. Uh, um, civil libertarians just going to go crazy. Are, are we going to burn the building down, right? And nothing happened. Nothing happened. So that's how the movement was born. It was a case of not something that I really wanted to do. It was just something that had to be done because the the, the structures or the, the, the people that, you know, we think are looking after us realistically aren't because um, when, when you look at constitutional lawyers, you, you look at the church system, you look at um, civil libertarians, and there's few of them around the world, this is the final frontier of human tracking and for it to be dismissed when it's the same company that's manufacturing a microchip for your dog, right, spins a company off to put a chip in a human, like, just wake up, folks. Well, already we have RFID ink, so therefore we have a, a, the ability to tattoo rather than implant chips. So when I say implanting chips, think of pets. So your pet's escaped, so you don't know where the pet is. We need to be able to track it, someone finds the pet. Being able to work out where and where that pet is is something that most people would do. It's almost normal now to microchip animals. There's reasons for microchipping criminals, for microchipping Alzheimer's or people who don't have any motor, you know, motor control over their bodies. There's reasons to you know, sort of chip all sorts of different people from clubbers in Spain to officials in Mexican governments to all sorts of different security reasons as to why it may be a good idea. And there's lots of arguments for and why these things should happen. And we start thinking, well, would I want to carry a microchip around in me? A few years ago, the uh, Hollywood documentarist Aaron Russo was approached by Nicholas Rockefeller, one of the Rockefeller family, and told, you really do good work. You ready to make good documentaries. Why don't you work for us and help us shape the future of mankind? And according to Aaron Russo, he asked him, he said, well, what is the game plan? What is the agenda? And according to Russo, Rockefeller replied, to microchip the population and have the rich people control the world. So there's the game plan, okay? Of course, they're not going to say, we want to microchip you so we can control you. No, no, no. It's going to be for the, to save the children or to save your favorite pet. There's always going to be some rationale for why they want to use this. Probably it will come in the form of credit. Right now, one of the biggest uh, problems in the credit card industry is, is identity theft. Somebody using your credit card. So what better way than to say, well, protect your credit by having a chip implanted in your wrist or your forehead or somewhere, your neck. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very dangerous stuff because uh, if you ever saw the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, uh, they could make a chip that they could trigger and it could explode, give you an aneurysm and kill you right then. So that's real control. So I think we should be very, very cautious about any effort to microchip the population. The long-term goal is to tag you, is to make you electronically aware, so that way you are meshed into a network. So when you actually look at the word online, online actually means to be under the direct control or connected to a mainframe. So the, the semantics, the science of semantics, they, they tell us what the word means. So when I, I take an RFID chip, I'm online, I'm connected. A network, what is a network? 
I'm worked into the net. What is a net? A net is something that catches you or ensnares you. What is the web? Worldwide web. What is a web? It catches, it ensnares. Without nanotechnology and microchips, they could not build their total central global control system of every man, woman and child on the planet. So it appears when it's necessary. In Internet Protocol version 4, which is the current web that we have, you had a 32-bit address, which means you have so many IPs um, and we're basically running out of them, right? So they've created something that's called Internet Protocol version 6. Now, what that will do is that will allow for every single product, right, on the face of this earth, including going to grains of sand even and specks of dust is possible to actually be RFID slash EPC tagged. So if we're sitting at this table, that particular bottle would have its own web page, right? That would have its own web page. The table would have its own web page. And I could query that particular product, how it arrived here, who is drinking it in, in proximity to me because I might have other RFID products. So what you're doing is you're building this meshed world this internet of things where any object is communicating with any person at any time but the thing is who is it communicating to and the thing that it's communicating to who who are these people it's sun microsystems and it's ibm and what will they do with this data so that's what we're saying is yep there will always be a benefit approach the genome project cure cancer cure alzheimer's it's, it's, it'll always cure. I haven't seen any cures. I've, you never will see any cures because that's the lie. It's, it's the benefit approach. The question now is, what are we going to do about it? What can we do about it? There have always been those who wish to control mankind and they see themselves as illuminated to some degree. But this right to control, to dictate, is not something that should be forced upon us. We have the right to free speech, to protest, to stand up and say, we won't take this. There are many who are waiting for a revolution, waiting for the people to riot, to fight back on a physical level. And these people appear to be the very individuals who control us in the first place. If riots take place and the people take this fight to the government, then expect a lot of casualties and little support from those still inside the proverbial box. Many believe this revolution will take a different form and the fight will be won in other arenas. We all know this. We all know what's happening. The, the trick is to get that awareness from deeper levels of self into the conscious mind. Because of course, the, the, the human, human consciousness, it's like a, an iceberg. I mean, only a fraction of our consciousness is conscious awareness, like me talking to you now. We um, carry fantastic amounts of information, understandings, awareness, at deeper levels of self. Um, and it's, it's bringing it to the conscious mind that is the key. Because this conspiracy overwhelmingly is subliminal manipulation. I believe, you see, that the so-called Dark Brotherhood, the Illuminati and so forth and so on are not as much a problem as the members of our, of our own community, so-called, who can't get into focus, who continually are fighting, who continually trying to separate and fragment and accuse and debunk and all of these kinds of things. I think we have to clean up our own house first you know, before we can even take on the common enemy. The common enemy knows this, so they continually perpetuate the agent provocateur, you know, um, fifth columnist agenda to make sure that we can't get our bows and arrows together and, and we can't even find, you know, it's like the three stooges running around here. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the cul-de-sacs of conspiracy research is you get so focused on the twigs you can't see the forest it doesn't matter if they're called the illuminati or aunt ethel's teapot 
It doesn't matter. What matters is that they um, exist and what they're trying to do and how they are manipulating us to make it happen. So, you know, we can talk about names of organizations and I do, but whether they're called the Illuminati or whether they're called something else really doesn't matter. I mean, you know, we've got to get out of that and, and, and into this and see how the, the things fit together instead of getting so focused, train spotter style on um, fine bloody detail. Because um, I, I see, you know, conspiracy researchers arguing over fine detail. The house is on bloody fire and they're arguing about, you know, what, what, what the name is of the door they want to go through to try to call the fire brigade. You know, I mean, excuse me, what are we having this conversation for? The house is on fire. What are we going to do about it? Kingship is the coming together of all the knights, coming together of all the voices. It's a symposium because no one person is ever going to have the right idea. Remember, one single leader can either be corrupted or threatened or compromised as well. So it's actually a vulnerable thing to have a single leader because that's, that's no threat whatsoever to, you know, to, the, to the members of the Black Lodge at all. Well, there's two ways of facing a problem. There's finding a solution and we're bloody drowning in them. And there's removing the cause of the problem. There are many levels to the cause of the problem, but the, f the fundamental one is most people are not conscious. They're in mind. They're in computer, body computer reality. So <clears throat> becoming conscious is vital because everything comes from that. People say, what do I do, what do I do? Well, become conscious and you'll know what to do. Firstly, you have to recognize that it's happening. Secondly, you have to then protect the innocents from it. And by that, I mean your children around you and those people around you that you love and care for. That's the first place to start with your children. We have to start with our children. And so I teach my children when I see something afoot, I will point it out. But I will also teach them a lot of good things too. You know, balance is all important. Um, can we overcome the mass manipulation that's, that's ongoing? We can if we all do that. Because our children will grow up and will say, I'm not having that, I'm not watching that. And the figures, the viewing figures will go down and the products won't be bought, etc., etc. As it is today, it's obvious that we haven't been teaching our children. It's obvious that we're allowing the stupidity that's within us to over, overcome the, the, the wisdom that's within us. In a way, the idea of inevitability I find particularly difficult because it disempowers people. If something's inevitable, then there's nothing you can do about it. I actually think it's beholden on every single person to do something about this, to do something about the future for their children, to fight for the hard-won civilization that we've got here in Britain, which is still a reasonably good civilization as a standard of living uh, compared to other parts of the world. The, the solution for our movement is you need to have preventative legislation put into place for microchipping, right? That is, that is, it is a lot harder to overturn legislation than it is if it's not there. So that is the first goal because once one is microchipped, it's it's the end. It, it's like that, that. That is just the final frontier. I mean, once the human populace is microchipped, it's it's, it's over. It, it's as simple as that. So, what I say is, you know, fight the fight on different levels. You know, if you're nine eleven truth or whatever, you know, it, it all it all helps, right? It's all. But the, the the point is is when man is reduced to inventory, right? The, the war is lost. The war is lost. You know what you need to do to make a contribution to unraveling what's going on in the world. You don't need to ask, what should I do? You bloody know. Mind has to ask, what shall I do? Because it's bewildered. It doesn't know what's going on. Consciousness knows what to do. So becoming conscious is absolutely vital to everything that follows from it and therefore everything that is necessary to bring down this house of cards which we are currently holding up.